The story of Bada Kundalakesi. A rich merchant of Rajagaha had only one daughter called Bada, who was 16 years old and extremely beautiful and fair to see. She was also extremely passionate and easily swayed by those passions. So the merchant and his wife, fearing that she would one day disgrace herself or fall into harm's way, lodged her in a tower of royal splendour high above their house with only a single servant as company. One day, a young man who was the son of a Brahmin was caught stealing. Although he was of a good family, he had been dissolute and in the habit of thievery, and now he had gone too far, and the king's men arrested him and led him through the streets to prison. High above the street, the young woman heard the shouts of the crowd and saw the young man being led towards the king's prison. She instantly fell in love with him and took to her bed, refusing to eat, saying she must marry him or she would surely die. Her mother came to reason with her, saying there were so many fine young men of station who would make excellent husbands, but the daughter would have none of it. After the father too had failed to persuade her, the parents worried that knowing her nature as they did, their daughter's passionate infatuation would ruin her health or worse if they did not agree to satisfy her wishes. So the father sent a thousand pieces of gold to the jailer and asked for the young man to be secretly released and sent to his home. The merchant gave his daughter in marriage to the dubious young man and she resolved to win her husband's favour. From that time on, she adorned herself with her finest jewels and prepared her husband's meals with her own hands. After a short while, the robber became restless. Seeing the woman adorned in the jewels, he thought, How can I rid myself of this troublesome woman? Take her jewels and return to the taverns in which I love to drink. And so he hatched a plan. He took to his bed and refused to eat. His wife came to him and asked what was the matter. After many questions, he finally told her that when he was being led to prison and probably to execution, he had made a vow to the deity that lived at the top of Robber's Cliff that if the deity could contrive through his supernatural power to set him free, then he would make an offering as thanks. The young wife readily agreed to help the robber fulfil his vow. So she prepared the offering of hard and soft food, together with many spices. When she was finished, he said she should put on all her jewels, and they should walk through the city together, with a merry aspect for all to see. When they got to the foot of the mountain, they bade farewell to their company, and made the journey up the mountain. Now Robber's Cliff was easy to climb on one side, but a precipice on the other. When they reached the very top, she said, Husband, present the offering. But her husband made no reply. Again she spoke, Husband, why do you remain silent? He said, I have no use for offerings, and I have no use for you. I have deceived you in order to kill you and take your jewels. As if awakening from a dream, she suddenly saw her husband's true character. Terrified by fear of death, she pleaded with him to spare her life, offering anything in return. But he dismissed her pleas, saying any promise could easily be broken once they returned to the city. When he threw her to the ground, she knew her last moments of life were likely upon her. Now sobered by the realisation of the extent of her husband's wickedness, she gathered her wits and tried to formulate a plan to save herself. She said to him, Though you were caught in an act of robbery and led through the streets, I told my mother and father to send a thousand pieces of gold to ransom you and release you into my care, and from that time I have been your benefactress. In my last act, let me pay obeisance to you, husband. Mildly amused by her, he replied, Very well, do as you wish, then prepare to die. 
So she walked around him three times in the traditional manner that was familiar to him and embraced him behind and then deftly twisted and turned and dropped to the ground and threw him off balance and over the edge of the cliff. The deity that had lived on top of the mountain had all the while observed the actions of the two and applauding the woman remarked, Wisdom is not at all confined to men. A woman too is wise and shows it now and then. But now Bada was bereft and overcome with remorse for her actions. She had not taken a life lightly and felt a disgust for the world. She threw off her jewels and resolved not to return home, but wandered into the forest. After some time of wandering, she finally came across a hermitage of nuns in the forest, and having resolved to renounce all passions and the worldly life, she asked to be admitted into their order. The head nun admitted her, and when she was ordained, she asked what the highest goals of their religious order were. She was told there are two goals considered the highest. The first was the mastery through the ten casinas of the deep calm meditation of the jhanas, or secondly, the mastery of the one thousand articles of faith. She did not believe she could gain mastery in meditation, so she chose the path of study. But as soon mastered the thousand articles of faith, becoming proficient in question and answer to every conceivable point. The nuns thought, this Bada will be a great ambassador for our order. So they placed a branch of the rose apple tree in her hand and told her to go across the land and challenge all to debate with her on these articles of faith. Should any defeat her, then she should ordain with them if they would belong to another religious order, or become their slave if they were a layman. So, adopting the name, none of the rose apple, Bada journeyed across the land, challenging all to match question and answer with her. Such was her reputation, it is said that the local worthies fled on her approach, crying, Here comes the nun of the rose apple! Finally she came to Savati. She placed a branch of the rose apple at the front of one of the gates of the city and made her customary challenge. Hear this! Let him who can match me with question and answer come trample this rose apple branch and then went into the city to seek arms. Now the elder Saraputta passed the gate on his return from his arms rounds and saw the rose apple branch. He asked the local children if they knew what it meant and they explained matters to the elder. He said to them, go trample the branch, I will answer the questions. And so they did as he bade them. When the nun returned, she rebuked them, saying, I will not bandy words with children. Why did you trample the branch? So the children told her that they did so at the elder's behest. So she approached him and asked, Well, sir, will you match question and answer with me? And the elder said he would. So they settled down, and a crowd drew round to see and hear the encounter of the two. The nun said, Reverend Sir, I wish to ask you a question. Ask it, sister. So she asked him questions on the one thousand articles of faith. Every question the nun asked, the elder answered correctly. Finally, he said, You have asked me these few questions. Are there any others? She answered, These are all, Reverend Sir. Sariputta then said, You have asked me all these questions. I will ask you just one. Will you answer me? Ask your question, Reverend Sir. Then the elder asked her the following question. What is the one? She said to herself, This is a question I should be able to answer and she pondered the depth of the question. She realised there were several answers that could fit such a question. But this question, as put by the elder, went to the root of being, and as such, 
there could only be one right answer. Not knowing the right answer, and perceiving the elder was possessed of deep wisdom, she inquired, What is it, Reverend Sir? That is the Buddha's question, he replied, and said if she wished to know the answer, she should ordain in the Buddha's order. And so the story goes. She met with the Buddha, and he put the question, which is question one of the ten novices' questions. What is the one? And then he gave the answer. All living beings subsist on food. Coming from a perfectly enlightened Buddha, the words went deep, and she understood the depth of both the question and the answer. And then the Buddha pronounced a single verse of Dharma, and Buddha attained full enlightenment. Seeing understanding arise within her, the Buddha admitted her into the order of nuns with the words, Come Buddha. She became famous as the female disciple who most quickly became fully enlightened, an arahat, and she was known as Kundalakesi. Some time later, the monks and nuns were gathered in the Dharma Hall and discussed the extraordinary story of Kundalakesi, how after fighting for her life and defeating the fearsome robber, she defeated all in debate as a nun, but finally encountered the Buddha and attained to the ultimate goal so quickly after hearing so little. The Buddha replied the Dharma should not be measured by little or much, and then pronounced the following stanzas. Better than reciting a hundred meaningless verses is the reciting of one verse of Dharma, hearing which one attains peace. Though one may conquer a thousand times a thousand men in battle, yet he indeed is the noblest victor who conquers himself.